First of all, thanks so much, Sean, for uh, you know, inviting me to be here today and for the brilliant introduction. <laughs> Uh, so the talk today is going to be about network visualization at, at the age of infinite interconnectedness. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few topics today. I got plenty of time, so I'm going to talk first about the outburst of, of visualization and you know one of the key, some of the key reasons behind this outburst is emergence of visualization. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about visualcomplexity.com, which is a, a project, a website that some of you might already know. Uh, and then talk about some trends and methods in the field of network visualization. Uh, talk about some principles, um, and then finally end up with a little bit of a teaser. Uh, you know, is our networks becoming a new cultural meme? So the first time I actually heard about information visualization was actually to a, a teacher of mine called Christopher Kerwin, and it was a really sort of inspiring lecture at Parsons School of Design. And he showed us this diagram called the, the Understanding Spectrum by Nathan Shadroff, where data leads into information, information leads into knowledge, and knowledge ultimately leads into wisdom. And even though my background was actually uh, industrial design, I was just so compelled to be part of that process, particularly that divide between producers and consumers, between information and knowledge, and how to best create a bridge between those two elements. But of course, many of you might, you know, of course, say that information visualization is not something new. We have been doing it for ages as human beings, right? I mean, some of these examples are, are remarkable. This one is the diagram of the square of opposition uh, you know, from 1505, done by the Spanish scholar Juan de Salaya, mapping a lot of philosophical concepts and, and, and contradictions. A uh, beautiful, remarkable example of visual complexity in the, min in the Middle Ages. And then you have the, the beautiful examples of, of Ramon Lull, uh, the guy, you know, the very original guy behind a lot of the binary code. Uh, so these, actually, these diagrams, you know, creating a new language, were done more than 700 years ago, and they still have, you know, remarkable quality to them. And even though, even if you look back at the history of humankind, you can identify key milestones where visualization played a key role in, you know, changes in society and the culture of the time. In fact, Professor Alfred Crosby, in his uh, really interesting book called The Measure of Reality, says that Visualization and measurement were the two factors most responsible for the rapid development of all modern science. Uh, and I highly advise you to, if you haven't read that book, it's really interesting that it explores you know, our obsession for visualization and for measurement and quantification through the Middle Ages. So it's like, you know, the very sort of original foundation for a lot of the work that we actually do, do nowadays. But as all of us know, of course, this outburst of visualization has occurred you know, within the past 10 years or so. Even when I launched the blog, there was only a few other blogs, I think maybe two or three, around the topic of, of information visualization. It was still very niche, a niche sort of market. Uh, but then, of course, in the last five years, it has been an explosion of blogs and websites, many of them really, really specific on a specific method, method or technique about visualization. So this outburst of, this outburst of interest for visualization has primarily six reasons um, that I'm, I would like to expose. The first one is really tied, it ties back with computing storage. And it's, it really explains that our ability to generate data has by far outpassed our ability to make sense of that, of that data. And a great example to understand you know, this first reason for this outburst of visualization, computing storage, is to look at Kreider's law. And Kreider's law is actually very similar to, to Moore's law. It just says that our disk capacity doubles every 18 months. And Kreider's law has been actually being, you know, in most cases, you know, correct, although it has been slowing down you know, over the past two years. But if you, if you take Crider's Law, and you can see Crider's Law in many different cases, probably the best one that everyone can relate to is the iPod. Uh, so the iPod, when it was firstly launched in 2001, had five gigabytes of storage. Uh, six years later, uh, the same iPod, the iPod Classic, had 160 gigabytes of data. Right? This is the Crider's Law in action. And then if you actually take that analogy, the Crider's Law, and, and pr actually project that into the future, according to some projections, by the year 2030, a regular laptop like the one I have in front of me would have the ability to store one petabyte of data. This is a very knowledgeable audience, so that means one petabyte is one million gigabytes of data. And even more striking is that if you compare that to be 10 times all the books of the biggest library in the world, which is the Library of Congress. So it's the equivalent of storing 300 million books in your laptop. And again, the challenge is not so much to store all this information, but really to make sense, to filter, and make that bridge between information and knowledge. 
Another example I, I usually give when we talk about computing storage is you know, this effort of, you know, it has been going on from you know, the, Greek, the ancient Greece, of gathering the whole of human knowledge. Uh, so in 1751, uh, it was the biggest encyclopedia of the time, the, the, the French encyclopedia by Diderot and Lambert. And at the time, this massive encyclopedia had 70,000 articles, uh, 3,000 illustrations, and it was comprised of 35 volumes. If we compare to the, to the recent, you know, to the latest Wikipedia in just the English version, in 2009, Wikipedia, the English version, actually surpassed the 3 million uh, mark of number of articles. And it had 2, two million e something images, probably more now. Uh, and then, actually, someone went to the effort of calculating all that information in physical volumes, and it calculated to be around, roughly around 1,300 volumes of information. And that's purely text, really tiny font as well. <laughs> so excluding any kind of illustrations or images, which is, you know, again, really, really striking, this, you know, this explosion of computing storage. So the second reason for this outburst of interest for visualization is really tying back with open data sets. Data has never been so widely accessible at such a minimal cost. I mean, many of us that deal on a daily basis with, with online social services, it has been, data has become this online currency. You know, we, we exchange, we give some data to receive some data in return. That's usually the, the way it works. And then not only that, but you actually see a lot more companies, institutions, cities, and, and governments and countries itself really opening up their public data sets to the general public. And this, of course, has been extremely beneficial in many ways. What you can see here is actually some of the projects that have been taking advantage of a lot of these open data sets. Uh, so some of them allow you to upload your own data uh, or, or, or use existing data sets on the server and visualize them in different ways. Uh, probably the best one at doing that is, is Many Eyes, an IBM-led initiative. But many of them, you know, already exist, and we probably, you know, many more will actually, you know, pop up in the next in the next few years. So the third key reason, uh, in my view, for this outburst is really tying back to again online social networks, and we might think, you know, it's primarily about mapping really, really complex relationships, and that's that's definitely the case. I mean, for social sciences, this is a great opportunity never that we never had before to map these really, really complex communities, you know, such, such as Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. But it's not just about mapping these really, really complex relationships between people. It's also about discovering patterns within the abundance of shared content. Uh, it's about uncovering music affinities by mapping services like uh, Last.fm, or even trying to understand how human beings categorize information by visualizing different aspects of the social bookmarking system delicious. But even more than that, a lot of these online social networks are providing us, users, with a remarkable number of tools allowing us to track and map the most mundane daily activity, from tracking how your mood changes over time using mood stats, to how many miles you run in a day, or even track your sexual activity in, a, in bad post, which is a remarkable project. <laughs> uh, so online so social networks have really, really this power to really, and really this force behind a lot of this new interest for visualization. The fourth key reason is really the democratization of a lot of those tools. And again, if we go back a few years, a lot of you know, visualization was a very you know, scientific uh, arena that only a few people with high, you know, a high sort of knowledge for, for programming could actually be, you know, develop any project in this, in this field. But more and more, we see different tools making it a lot more accessible, usable for a lot more people. And this is actually one of the key reasons. So these are, are some of those tools, and many more exist, and many more will, again, continue to exist Many more will pop up in the next few years. But a lot of these tools, such as Flash, Processing, et cetera, are just making it a lot more easy and accessible. And those are a key reason that explains why art and design are really joining this, this, this visualization effort that for a long period of time was just uh, within the, the scientific uh, area. So the fifth reason for this outburst uh, is really tying with mainstream media. It's really this case for vernacular visualization. Uh, so all the projects that you actually see here uh, have been, yeah, the contrast is a little bit awkward, but uh, so all the projects that you actually see here have been developed by the New York Times. And of course, many of you are, are sort of paying attention to, you know, even the last U.S. elections, and you've seen, you know, not just the New York Times, but CNN, you know, Boston Globe, et cetera, et cetera, just really pushing the boundaries in, in, the, in the ways that they visualize a lot of the data that they already have. And services like the New York Times, New York Times is probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, in, in terms of you know, achieving that really well. But the New York Times 
and many other mainstream media have been really, really important in just changing the public awareness that visualization goes much further than the typical bar chart or the typical pie chart. It can be extremely rich, dynamic, interactive, and convey information in a much, much, much uh, more meaningful way. So the sixth and final reason is really a consequence of all those previous reasons. It's really that, you know, do all, because of all those reasons that we I just exposed before, you know, there's this growth of, of our community in itself, which, you know, some people call the numerati. Actually, Stephen Baker calls this community the numerati. And on the book by the same name, Stephen Baker says, the numerati are looking for patterns in data that describe something almost hopelessly complex, human life and behavior. Um, so again, if we go back a few years, we were just a few, right? Ten years, we were just a few scientists closing the you know, in a, in a room somewhere, trying to really knuckle our brains and trying to visualize different data sets. But this, this community has been growing at an outstanding pace and uh, growing and growing. <laughs> so as a numerati myself, uh, I've been primarily uh, interested and passionate about network visualization and really captivated by the power of networks. And this passion really started around six years ago. Uh, I was uh, I was doing uh, my master's degree in at Parsons School of Design in New York, and at the time I was really interested about uh, information diffusion, understanding how information spreads within across across a, a specific community of people, and this again has been a subject of interest for social science for many 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 years and centuries, and it has been really hard to tackle. So the, the idea of word of mouth and again how information spreads across people is really really hard to track within a physical environment. But then, of course, came the internet. It came the blogosphere, and it, it made actually it created this amazing social laboratory to, for us to investigate and to map how information spreads. So the analogy that I took for for my thesis was actually in URLs. So a particular URL that's posted in some blog, and now that same URL spreads across the blogosphere. And in many ways, there is a huge resemblance to how diseases spread within communities. It's actually a, a huge sort of similarity in the sense that the patterns are really, really similar. Some you know, they have this huge outburst and then completely die off. Others are very recurrently psych cyclical nature. And now I built this tool to really understand how the, that, that type of information, of particular URLs, memes, actually spread across the blogosphere. But to have a better understanding of, of, of the process, I first started to start collecting maps and visualizations of the, of the infrastructure itself, how the blogosphere and the World Wide Web was actually being mapped. So that's why I started collecting dozens and hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of projects, which became, uh, you know, visualcomplexity.com. And the goal has been to always leverage this critical understanding of, of different visualization methods across a very, you know, variety of disciplines from, you know, as diverse as biology, social networks, or, or the World Wide Web. What you actually see in the bottom, it's, it's a quote from Amanda Bloggs talking about visual complexity, where he says that in VC, the reader is just as likely to come across a representation of a protein network as they would be to see a map of a subway or social interaction. And you can really see this, this pluralistic effort when you look at all the different categories that I'm mapping currently on the website. So currently I'm mapping more than 750 projects, again, from social networks, from art, biology, World Wide Web, music, political networks, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you could probably you know, do the same, a similar website uh, only concentrating on, on, on biology or only concentrating on social networks. And you probably would have you know, many, many projects to analyze and, and, and expose. But I think that the key quality here is really to try to understand the, the vast variety of efforts from the vast variety of disciplines that people are, and the efforts that people are making in many, many different areas and disciplines. And only then we can really find sort of commonalities, differences and commonalities and common patterns in the way that people are trying to, to tackle and decipher a lot of these networks. And of course, the key reason also for this you know, holistic and pluralistic approach of visual complexity is that networks are really everywhere. It is this ubiquitous, omnipresent structure, right? So the brain is a network of nerve cells connected by axons. Cells themselves are networks of, of molecules connected by, by biochemical reactions. Of course, society is networks of people you know, by different degrees of relationships. And of course, on a larger scale, food webs, ecosystems are all represented by networks of species. And then, of course, it really ties back to a lot of the, our human technology that, you know, in the internet, power grids, transportation systems, those are just a few examples of what, you know, that really showcase how the network model is such an ubiquitous structure.